Okay, this one comes from Guilo583 on YouTube in response to a video that I did about inline functions. Guilo asked, could you please also explain the reified keyword? So yes, I intentionally omitted reified type parameters from that video just because it's a big enough topic that it kind of warrants its own video. And that's the video we're going to do today. I'll explain the reified keyword, including what it means and when you'll want to use it. So to understand reified type parameters, we first need to understand what happens to type information when we compile our project. In most cases, the type information that's in our source code is also available to us at runtime. So let's say, for example, that we're targeting the JVM and our source code includes a variable that's a string and a function that returns an integer. In these cases, the type information in our Kotlin code also exists in the JVM bytecode. But not all type information is available in the bytecode. So there are certain kinds of information that the compiler will omit whenever it's compiling our project. So specifically, this applies to type arguments. So for example, here's a function that retrieves the second item out of a list. Now, normally I would probably make this an extension function. It'd feel a little more natural, but because we're gonna be comparing the bytecode and our Kotlin code, I'm gonna make it just a regular function here. So this is a generic function, which means, as you know, that when we call this function here, the type argument is going to be string because this is a list of strings. But when we call this function from here, the type argument is an integer because this is a list of integers. Now let's look at the bytecode and then decompile that into Java and see what this function looks like under the hood. And when we do that, we see that the parameter type here doesn't have any information about the type of the items in the list. This is just what Java calls a raw type. So it's just the list without any other information about the kinds of things in the list. And the return type is not a string or an integer, it's just an object. And that's Java's equivalent of a Kotlin any. And because of that, whenever this function is called, there's also a cast back to the specific type, like you can see here for the string. And then here for the integer, it gets cast to a number and then this int value function is called. So in other words, even though we call this once with a string and once with an integer, the compiler doesn't generate overloads of this function, like one for strings and one for integers. It just creates one that works with objects. So in the compiled bytecode inside this function, we've lost the type information. And when this code is running, we don't know whether we've got a list of strings or a list of integers. And this is called type erasure. Now, conversely, type information that is available and both the source code and in, uh, at runtime is referred to in the Java language specification as a reifiable type. And that specification also says that the decision not to make all generic types reifiable is one of the most crucial and controversial design decisions involving the type system of the Java programming language. Ultimately, the most important motivation for this decision is compatibility with existing code. So in other words, 20 years ago, when Java introduced generics, type erasure was a way to ensure backward compatibility. And that's the legacy that we've got today. Now, the fact that these types are erased means that there are some things that we simply can't do at runtime. If a type is erased, then one thing we can't do is we can't compare an object to that type or cast an object to that type. So for example, here I've changed our function so that instead of returning the second item, it tells you whether the second item is of a certain type. And as you can see, this code doesn't compile. And why is that? Well, just like with our earlier function, this type argument is erased when our code is compiled. So at runtime, we can't check to see if this element has that type here, because at runtime, that type argument won't exist. We won't know what it is. Now, instead of calling this generic function to check the type, we could simply check the type directly at the call site. And this works just fine. Since this code isn't using string as a type argument, it's not erased when our code compiles and everything works just fine. So by putting the contents of this function directly in line here, we've got access to this type information at runtime. Now, as you recall, an inline function does basically the same thing that we just did manually. The contents of an inline function are just kind of dumped out into each call site. And so if this type can be known when we inline the function by hand, why can't it be known when we tell Kotlin to inline the function for us? Well, it can. 
So let's change this back so that it's calling our function. And then let's add the inline modifier to this function. And then the last thing we need to do is add a modifier to our type parameter declaration here. And that modifier is called rayified like this. So with the function inlined and the type parameter rayified, this code compiles just fine. The type argument's gonna be retained at runtime. So in other words, it won't get erased. And this code's gonna work as expected. Now, like before, let's decompile the bytecode into Java. And we can see that our type check is simply written in line here. And since there's no generic function call, there's no type erasure and everything's good to go. Now, there are other cases when we might want to pass type information along to a function. And one very common use case for this is when we're deserializing a string into a model. So we could run into this when we're using libraries like JSON or Jackson, or maybe when creating an object from a record in a database. But to demonstrate this today, I'm going to be using JaxP to turn this XML into an instance of a class. If you're not familiar with JaxP, that's totally fine. The main idea is that it's going to use these annotations to automatically instantiate an object with the values from the XML. So it's a lot like Kotlin X serialization, but it works with XML. Now the challenge is that we need to tell JaxP which class it should instantiate for this XML string. And in order to pull this off in Java, the way you usually see it is that we pass a class object like this. And so in this case, our XML string would be deserialized into an instance of product because of the second argument. And unmarshal, by the way, when you see marshal and unmarshal, just think serialize and deserialize. Now, if we find that we're repeating this kind of expression maybe throughout our project for different files and different class types, we might want to create a small extension function to do this for us. So let's do that. We'll create an extension function on unmarshaler, also called unmarshal. And then we'll just call through to the underlying function. And now we can update our call site to use this new function. So let's go here and take this out. Okay, great. That works, but with reified type parameters, we can actually eliminate that second parameter that we've got there. So let's take it out, both from the call site and from the function declaration. And we'll get the class object off of the type parameter like this. Now here you can see we get a compiler error. And as you probably guessed, that's because of type erasure. The type argument is erased and so it's not known at runtime. And the solution of course is to change this to an inline function and mark the type parameter as reified. And now we've got a lot less boilerplate at our call site. Kotlin's using type inference to figure out what type to use here. And since we're assigning this to a variable of type product, product is gonna be the type argument passed to this unmarshal function. And alternatively, of course, we can just explicitly set the type argument here if we wanted to, like this, in which case we could remove the type from the variable declaration. But my preference is usually to infer the type of the type arguments instead of the type of a variable. So I'm gonna put it back. So as you can see, by inlining our functions and marking our type parameters as reified, we're able to step around type erasure and achieve things that we couldn't do without it, such as comparing types and getting the class object. Now, like everything, there are a few trade-offs to using reified type parameters. One of them, of course, is that the function has to be inlined. And as we talked about in that previous video about inline functions, that basically duplicates the body of that inline function everywhere that it's called. And so you wanna keep your inline functions small uh, in order to avoid really bloating your uh, compiled artifacts. Also remember that an inline function can be called from Java. It won't be inlined, but you can call it. But an inline function with a reified type parameter cannot be called from Java. So if Java interop is important for the project that you're working on, just keep that in mind. If you'd like to know more about how inline functions work, I'll link to the previous video where I cover inline functions, including the inline, cross inline, and no inline modifiers. If you'd like to know more about Kotlin, you should join hundreds of other Kotlin developers who have signed up for my new email newsletter, where you can be among the first to know about any new articles, videos, and projects that I'm working on. You can do that at newsletter.typealias.com. Thanks again to Guilo for requesting this video, and thanks to you for watching it. I will see you next time. You've read the chapters online, and now I'm proud to present the LeanPub edition of Kotlin, an illustrated guide. Take the book offline with you, 
mark it up in your favorite PDF software, and get early access to new chapters as they're written. You can pick up your copy today. Just go to book.typealias.com.